my most recent video about map design, a viewer pointed out that the thumbnail had a pretty negative tone. They're correct, and it's on purpose. But I realized while responding to them that not everyone is really going to understand the context for my feelings on the subject, and that I should really put out a video explaining the nuance in it. The thumbnail is in the same mold as one from a video I made a while back about gear builds. Those of you who had seen more than a stream or two of mine at the time, or watched my major YouTube uploads, would know that I repeatedly urged players to worry less about their gear, and worry more about aspects of the game that are more likely to make a difference in whether you win or lose. I don't even check a player's gear build on most VOD reviews. Running Kiver's splash matic gear does not mean you're going to play as well as Kiver. By the time you would become that skilled, you could easily end up actually disagreeing with Kiver's build, or thinking it doesn't fit you as well as it fits him, and then you'd find another build to be optimal. It's one of the last things that's going to make a difference in whether you win or lose, but it's one of the first reasons for losing that you hear out of the mouths of a lot of players who are struggling to get out of A or S rank, that they haven't had a chance to make a real gear build yet. This is because it's an aspect of the game that's currently outside of their control, that they haven't leveled up enough and grinded enough gear chunks to have the right gear yet. The fact that it's understandable that they haven't sorted this out yet makes it an easy excuse for a loss that they don't have to do anywhere near the same kind of difficult self-reflection about. It's like when I lean too much in the direction of blaming my teammates when sometimes all it's really doing is protecting me from having to self-reflect and hurt my pride as often. Most people struggle with some sort of blame game like this to some degree, and those that don't also tilt, but tilt differently. The reason I was hesitant to discuss gear builds, though, wasn't just that I think there are higher priorities for me to focus my content on. That alone should be enough, but on top of that, I'm very hesitant to make content that will give people, especially those who aren't as in touch with the competitive scene, who look to me as a representative of it, the wrong idea about what's important. The more people in the competitive scene make a big deal about any aspect of the game, the more their more casual audience is going to amplify those ideas and overgeneralize the game based on them. People make a lot of gear guides, because there's so much to say about gear, and it's a poorly explained aspect of the game, and it's an easy content idea that'll get clicks. Those guides will be useful, but seeing so many videos being made about it can give people the impression that poor gear builds might be a reason they're losing matches. For a while, then, I figured the best I could do as a content creator was to avoid the subject and focus on the things that really did matter. There eventually came a point where there were interesting things to say about gear, and at the time I was torn about whether it would be valuable to discuss the interesting role Ninja Squid had started to fill and what that could tell us about the state of the game. It was being used to cross open spaces and sneak through choke points because e-leaders had become so prevalent, and it was so easy to lock down a choke point if you knew someone was coming through it. More on that, by the way, in the next part of the series. This informs someone not just on what gear they should run to be like good players, but also on actual decisions they'll have to make in-game, and how gear builds should be made to support the decisions you intend to make. So I decided there was value in making the video in the end, but I also wanted to voice my reluctance. It felt like it would be out of character for me to discuss the subject after having been adamant for so long that it wasn't important. The same sort of situation has arisen about map design and this one hasn't been anywhere near as well communicated on my end. Since the launch of the game, competitive analysts have been complaining about the map design of the Splatoon 3 stages for being largely to blame for some negative shifts in the metagame, and just for being less fun maps at a competitive level. I've definitely come to agree with a lot of these criticisms, and think there are some interesting discussions that arise from them about how to play the game. But also, there are going to be more casual viewers of the channel who hear what I'm going to say and then turn around and tell their friends, Splatoon 3's maps are really bad, and leave it at that, providing no value to the conversation except to show the game in a negative light. After all, this series is going to end up being an hour of content in which I largely just raise problems I have with the map design. No matter how positively I try to spin it, no matter how carefully I moderate my tone, someone's going to come away with that impression, and that bothers me. It's the same kind of conversation as when someone hears that you play League of Legends and makes the tired joke that you need an intervention. Oh no, why would you do that to yourself? I already know someone's writing in the comments, you lost me when you said it's okay to like League of Legends or something like that. 
Yeah, League of Legends is a big time commitment, and that's a big reason I prefer Splatoon as an esport, but there are also a lot of cool things the community has done, and its production companies are the gold standard for esports, or even maybe any competition in general. It's a game that's worth enjoying, and someone acting, even as a joke, like playing it is a problem, is something that legitimately makes people feel less interested in giving it a try. I've seen it happen. I've seen people develop an intense hesitance to learn the game, not from having played it and developed their own opinion, but because of this manufactured reputation it has. When someone hears another person mention a game and just tweets dead game at it, it's the same story. It's a cheap shot. If you got upset about something like that, the writer would either troll you and instigate some more arguing, or they'd just put their hands up like, relax man, it's just a joke, why you gotta be so mad? But that sort of discourse, reductive and meaningless as it is, actually drives people's opinions when they only have so much knowledge about the game. The internet is driven on statements that are short, punchy, and wrong. And I worry about any opening I might leave for that kind of discourse, even now as I am directly addressing it. I feel more validated in this concern because there's another ongoing controversy in the community where I feel one side is being driven largely by Twitter hot takes from more casual elements of the Splatoon community. Pardon the tangent, this ended up being a bigger part of the script than I expected it to, but I think it's a valuable illustration about how this sort of discourse can be more powerful than we want it to be. And it's also something I really want to address in a timely fashion so I can get on with the rest of the series uninterrupted, so I'm just going to include it here. Right now there's an ongoing discussion among competitive players and tournament organizers about a rule set that restricts teams to running no more than two splash matics on a composition. Now, I'm all for four fun rule sets, where the tournament makes some arbitrary bans to force players to think outside the box and put together more creative weapon compositions than you'll find in the metagame at that time. Those sorts of things are really fun. They're great exercises for the theory crafters to puzzle out. But this discussion goes beyond that sort of light-hearted format. It's a suggestion for tournaments in general, even big ones. I'm hearing that casual players hate triple splash and think it's boring to watch. And there's a legitimate consideration being made of whether to tailor the game at the highest level to that concern. But I feel that that sort of opinion that casual players have is driven by these sorts of short, punchy, wrong statements. Reductive Twitter hot takes. Splatoon 3 is totally balanced, have you ever seen a crab tank fall over? And not on the basis of any real interest in competitive integrity. It's an easy thing to meme on, but memeing on something is not the same as raising legitimate concerns about it. A game being unbalanced is a really common complaint that people throw around, similar to Dead Game. It sounds way more carefully considered than it actually is to call a game an unbalanced snooze fest where every match has the same top tiers. But like, if those top tiers are fun, I don't care. When I was getting into Super Smash Bros. Melee, another game that frequently gets accused of being unbalanced, I hadn't been playing any tournament viable characters casually. I saw two top competitive players playing the character Marth, pushing the game to its limits, showing off movement I'd never seen before, and making the game look graceful, look beautiful. They were both playing the same character, but they had two different styles, two personalities that made the match engrossing to watch, and they were both doing things that my character couldn't. I wanted to be able to do those things. I learned that my characters were held back from playing like that, by slow frame data, poorer movement options, attacks that couldn't protect them as well or threaten the other player as much, so I decided to just drop my characters and learn to do what they were doing, because what they were doing was so cool. Would it have been better if my characters were also able to play at that level? Sure, that's a reasonable criticism of Super Smash Bros. Melee for the Nintendo GameCube, but people are still playing massive tournaments for Super Smash Bros. Melee for the Nintendo GameCube 22 years after its release and show no signs of slowing down. I feel much the same way about the splash matics place on the Splatoon 3 tier list as I felt about picking up Marth and Melee. If short-range shooters weren't meta, I would learn something that wasn't a short-ranged shooter because I enjoy playing the game competitively and want to learn strong strategies. Competitive players aren't following orders that they need to play splash -a, a lot of them are trying out all the available options and deciding that Splash feels best, that it works with their team best, or that they like it a lot. A lot of them care a lot more about winning the game than they do about whether the option they choose is something a random Twitter user would call boring. And while yes, the metagame is over-centralized on Splash at top level and the game is fairly unbalanced right now, first of all, there are still teams that are finding success running other things. 
I've seen a DivX team running double 52 gal. There are a bunch of E-leaders around still. Cherry Limeade are doing whatever they want. Running a silver arrow spray in the looty set that determined whether they made the playoffs. If the way you want to play the game is to express yourself with creative weapon choices, there are still plenty of opportunities to be successful doing so. There are top 500 players on just about every weapon imaginable. There are very, very few goals a player can set that aren't achievable with just about any weapon in the game. Play the game the way you enjoy it, but don't hold it against other players when they decide that they enjoy the game differently than you do. Certain weapons do give more advantages than others, so if you care more about winning than you do about not being boring, the choice you're going to make is going to depend on the state of the game, and right now, we're in crab meta. It's a really strong choice, and it makes sense that people are making it. It's not a permanent fixture of the game, either. Going back to Melee, aside from a few different versions being released in the first year or so, the game has never been and will never be patched by the developers to create new metagames. This means that nobody ever expected anything to change about the game. After three or four years of playing it, the competitive community collectively decided that having items turned off was best for the expressive, fluid, competitive play they were looking for, and they decided to make that the competitive standard. This has worked out because the game has never changed in such a way that might make items more interesting or fair, and because the community was able to adopt that rule widely enough that everyone was sure practicing the way they were practicing would help them in tournament conditions wherever they decided to go to compete. It took a lot of deliberation and a lot of testing both ways for everyone to arrive at that conclusion. Meanwhile, instead of three or four years, we in Splatoon 3 have something like a month before there's another balance patch that could completely upend crab meta. In that time, there will not be a sufficient tournament schedule to determine if the suggested rule change would even improve the viewing or playing experience of the game with a significant enough sample size. Maybe Double Crab is still something audiences would find boring. Maybe the change shifts the game toward an E-leader meta that people would hate even more. We don't know for sure what happens when we change variables like that. It takes time and iteration to figure those things out. It would take a long time to make the splash matic restriction feel like the competitive standard, the official way to play that's widely tested, understood, and accepted, rather than something people are doing at just a tournament or two. I worry that making changes based on shifting the tone of a high volume of Twitter hot takes will push us in the direction of making a tournament feel less like it tested who was best at the game and more like it tested whose playstyle got nerfed the least by restrictions that were imposed before players had time to adapt to them. A competitive game needs its biggest events to be the ones with the highest degree of competitive integrity, the ones that matter the most. They need to not have asterisks attached to their results like sudden rule changes. Bringing this back around to the original topic of the video, I want to leave you with this. There are absolutely valid criticisms of this game, or any piece of media, no matter how good they are. It's not wrong to voice these criticisms, and in fact, we can learn a lot about the game from them, about games in general, even about ourselves as people and what we do and don't enjoy. But when you voice them, it's also important to temper that criticism with the context that, yes, these are issues with the game, but I care about them all the more because I love the game and plan to continue playing it. I can see the bad, which is all the more an endorsement of the game because I still really want to play it anyway. The more reductive our criticism gets, the more we sell the game out for a cheap laugh or some upvotes in a YouTube comment section, the more we risk driving people away from an experience they would enjoy, and a community, which like any community, needs a constant influx of new players to continue to thrive. I always say that your value to your community is measured by the number of people you bring in minus the number of people you drive away. Please do not use the videos in this series, which I do believe have value for understanding the game, analyzing it better, and enjoying it more despite its flaws, to drive people away from the Splatoon community.